Alive. Book One, Chapter Twenty Two. She was standing before him, watching, waiting. Her face seemed to undulate, shifting out of focus and then to sharp clarity and back. He wanted to touch her, to hold her, but he could not reach out. An immobilizing lethargy seemed to have seized his entire body. He tried to call out, but found he could not speak. Then everything was suddenly fading away, falling into the swirling deep of an endless abyss. No! Dark nothingness. Don't leave me! Timeless void. Mommy! David was forced to wake by the sound of his own fearful cry. He bolted up in the bed, disoriented, blinking until the world came into focus. Where was this place? He was dressed in soft white robes, sitting in a large oval bed with silky sheets and plush pillows. The walls were of finely polished wood and decorated with colorful paintings, lined with shelves that were stacked with aged, hardbound books. Everything smelled of ocean morning and freshly washed linen. He heard music, soft and lilting, flowing through the room like a gentle breeze. Teddy was sitting at the foot of the bed, watching him curiously. Hello, David, the toy bear said. Teddy, David said, still groggy. Where are we? Then he saw the man standing in the doorway, gazing on him with smiling eyes. Good morning, Ellen Hobby said, laughing gently. That must have been some dream, he said. David remembered now. Professor Hobby, he said, relieved. He rubbed his eyes and fell back into the bedding with a sigh. It's Dad now, remember, Hobby said. David sat up and smiled. Yeah, Dad, almost forgot about that, he said. They stared at one another, until they were both sure it was really still happening. Then Hobby sighed. I half expected to find this room empty, he admitted. Then I would have called my shrink to tell him I was having hallucinations. <laughs> Wonderful hallucinations. David screwed up his face. What's a shrink, he said. Hobby laughed at that. David didn't get the joke, but decided he liked the sound of his father's laughter. What is that music? David said. Ah, uh, yes. That is a lute, David, Hobby explained. He pinched his chin, thinking, Now, I don't choose these streams, but if I'm not mistaken, this is most likely an Italian piece. It has that romantic flair. It's strange, David said, his ear cocked. It's like happy and lonely at the same time. I think wistful is the word you're looking for, Hobby said. I like it because it's interesting enough for listening, but not so obtrusive that it distracts me from my work. David nodded, acknowledging the man's words, while listening to the gentle notes wafting through the room. It's beautiful, he said. They were both quiet for a time, listening, until Hobby broke the spell of the music. Well, come on, sleepyhead, he said. You've got a busy schedule today. David instantly forgot about the strange, beautiful music. Mommy, he said, throwing off his covers and jumping to his feet. Hobby winked a confirmation. But how about some breakfast first, he said. David readily agreed. David stared at Hobby, eyes wide, brows raised, and lips pursed. After a moment, he swallowed. What is this? he said, amazed. That is Eggs Benedict, David, in hollandaise sauce, Hobby replied. He took a bite off his own plate and rolled it in his mouth. Mmm, cooked lightly in olive oil with a touch of basil, I believe. David forked up another mouthful and downed it quickly. This must be the first time I've ever ate real food, he said. Eaten, David, Hobby corrected, slipping easily back into parental mode after so many years. 
first time you've ever eaten real food, and not so fast, savor your meal. David hesitated, wondering when the new chain of command had been established. But after a moment, he accepted the shift of authority. There was something normal about it. He tried to slow down, but it wasn't easy. The food was delicious. Since his stay in the hospital, he had come to take the eating process for granted. It was how the body functioned. He enjoyed eating primarily because he was usually hungry when he did so. But now, he realized, it could be an experience, something to look forward to. Hobby watched the boy thoughtfully. So, apart from your trip with Chiyoko and Hiro, where have you been all this time? he said. David chewed slower, trying to avoid answering the question. He didn't feel like talking about Lord Johnson Johnson or Sai's gang, and he definitely couldn't tell anyone about the hospital the morphing bots, and the man named Grieg or Jeff or Frank. Anyway, he had much more important things on his mind. He had Mommy on his mind. When he finally swallowed, an inadvertent belch followed. He grinned apologetically when his father frowned. See what happens when you eat too fast? Hobby said. So anyway, where you been? David shrugged, toying with his food. I've been around, he said. Then he forked up another mouthful to avoid answering whatever question was coming next. Around, Hobby said. And where's that? But the man was interrupted by something that whistled like a bird. David looked around the room, puzzled. Hobby pulled a small oblong disc from his shirt pocket and placed it on the table. He put a finger to his lips, signaling David to be quiet. Then he pressed receive. Morning, Grace, he said. Alan, hi. So I checked into the matter you called me about last night. Henry Swinton will be at the New Jersey facility today at about noon. Looks like Cyberchild is cleaning our clock with their Sim Susie knockoff, and he's leading a divisional get-together, some sales prep thing. Did you want me to book you? No, Grace, no, thank you. That's all I wanted to know. I'll be out today. Forward anything big, but you handle the usual suspects for me, okay? Sure, sure. So, what's going on with you, mister? Had a copter locked out for 45 minutes last night. Ariel is being all hush-hush about it. You go out partying with the scavengers or something? Hobby winked at David. Well, aren't you just the busybody, he said to Grace. That's my job. That's odd. I'd swear I hired you for R&D. Gossip seems like such a waste of a post-doctorate. Well, somebody's got to do it. I would challenge that assertion if I didn't have anything else to do this morning. You'd lose. Oh, and out of curiosity, I checked with security. You know, after you asked me if anything strange had been reported. Go on. Well, apparently... One of the Davids took a little stroll yesterday out by the old dock. Nobody knows how it got down there, but security caught it. Said there was something strange about it. Creepy was the word he used, actually. Said it had a toy bear with it. Well, you know those Davids, Hobby said. They can be quite willful. David snickered into his hand. Hobby shushed him with a playful glare. I guess. Anyway... Mario sent an Alfred down to pick the thing up, but it never showed. And now the Alfred is missing. Can't bring up its link, either. It's almost like somebody blocked it. Hmm? Hmm, indeed, Hobby said, smiling mischievously and gesturing at the Alfred, which was standing at silent attention in a corner. David covered his mouth to keep from laughing. Sounds pretty mysterious, all right, Hobby said. Keep me posted on that, okay? Alan! Grace? Don't play games with me, you scandal. The elevator's last stop was your floor, where it was locked up for hours. What's going on up there, mister? Come on now, Grace. You know how temperamental elevators can be. They get tired, up and down and up and down all day, everybody pushing their buttons. Well, aren't we in a clever mood this morning? Spill it, old man. A new David? An upgrade? What gives? 
Grace, Hobby said. Have I ever kept anything from you that you know of? Alan. You keep saying that. You are a pest. Grace laughed. Look, I know you're up to something. Just don't leave me out of the loop for too long, okay? It's getting boring around here. You'll be the first to know, Hobby said, and slipped the phone back in his pocket. David let his laughter come, and Hobby joined in. Won't be able to fool her for long, Hobby said. She's sharp, one of the best. He became thoughtful, pensive. She's been with me from the beginning, he said, almost to himself. David took a sip of his orange juice, hoping the man wasn't going to start asking questions again. But it turned out he had something else on his mind. When I first embarked on the David, on you, Hobby said. She asked me a question, one that I now see I did not give enough consideration. The man shifted uncomfortably, as if he were embarrassed by the memory. She asked if a Mecca can truly love a human. Did the human have any responsibility in return? David put his glass down and leaned back. He could tell this was going to be an important discussion. And, he said. Hobby picked up a fork and pushed his half-eaten meal around on his plate. And I said something which was very arrogant, David, although I didn't see it that way at the time. I said that God had created Adam to love him. David knew the story of Adam and Eve. It was part of an ancient religious text. There was a time when he would have been able to summon it from his memory banks, but now he only remembered the gist of it. Hobby continued, But we aren't gods, David. We are Orga. The path of our history is riddled with good ideas gone wrong. Our pursuits are typically no better than our intention. David chewed on this idea. He had been so busy trying to survive that he hadn't had much time for this type of thinking. But here, with no one to run from, his stomach full on the best meal he'd ever had, his mind began to ponder. What was your intention? he said. Hobby seemed surprised by the question. He stumbled for a response. Well, I guess we were trying to push the boundaries. Simulating life has always been a dream of science. I wanted to create a robot that would learn to see the world through its own internalized logic, reason, dreams. I admit that is a rather deific aspiration. David wasn't sure what that meant, but he didn't want to interrupt. And of course there were monetary issues, the man continued. We're a business after all. We wanted to profit from a market that was ripe for exploitation. Maybe I moved too fast. Didn't consider all the ramifications. David placed his palms flat on the table, unconsciously announcing that he had something to say. Hobby noticed and grew quiet. I met a gang of kids in the forest, David said. He paused a moment, but then decided to bear all. They were thieves, and I helped them steal from people. Maybe I could say that I was trapped and had no choice, but they became my friends, and I admit it was fun sometimes. Well, most of the time, actually. Hobby leaned back and crossed his arms, but there was no judgment in his eyes. David continued. Their leader was called Sai. He was a big man and could get pretty mean sometimes. But other times, it was like he really cared about us. He never wanted anyone to get hurt, and the rules he made seemed strict, but they were there to protect the group. He taught me a lot of bad stuff, illegal stuff, tricks and scams. But he also taught me things I needed to know, like how to think fast, how to be tough and defend myself, how to go after what I want. David laughed. No time for dallying, pork chop, he used to tell me. Pork chop, Hobby said. David shrugged. That's what they used to call me. Wizzy's teasing smirk came into his mind, and an unexpected pang of nostalgia washed over him. I might not have made it here without them, he said. Yes, there are some precepts that are universal, Hobby said. 
Good can come from bad, and both are often subjective. David hummed as he digested the words. A flower falls, even though we love it, and a weed grows, even though we do not love it, he said. Hobby nodded, impressed. That has an eastern flavor. Something you learn from Hero? Chioko told me, David said. It's the words of a man who lived a long time ago. But what I mean is that maybe you were being selfish when you made me, but I'm glad you did. I was happy with Mommy, and she was happy too. Thinking of her brought on a flood of emotion, and David fought it back. It wasn't your fault when Martin came home, he said. But he trailed off then, not sure how to continue. Are you trying to say that you forgive me? Hobby said. I'm trying to say I accept what happened now, and I just want to see what's next. Hobby was visibly moved. He sat up straight and cleared his throat, dabbed at his eyes with his napkin. Well, once again you surprise me, David, he said. And I think I can predict what's in store for you now. He pulled his phone from his pocket and thumbed out a code. Mr. Hobby, said a male voice. Ariel, clear a passenger copter. No logo. I'll be traveling under the name Graham Holt and Son. He looked at David warmly when he said this. Please keep everything off the logs again, like last night, and meet us at the copter bay in, say, 30 minutes. 10-4, sir. Hobby rose and smiled at his boy. Well, I'm certainly happy we had a chance to talk things through, he said. Now let's see what Alfred can dig up for you to wear to see your mother. David's face lit up like a new day's dawn. The stone torch of the great sunken lady towered above the waters beneath them, then receded as they passed. Manhattan shrunk quickly behind. Then there was only the deep shifting blue, broken occasionally by the tip of a sunken building or the massive struts of a submerged suspension bridge. They passed a small strip of an island, cluttered with abandoned ruins and surrounded by the anchored boats of drifters and scavengers. David thought he saw Hero's boat among them, but Ariel flew by so quickly that he couldn't be sure. He sat back and adjusted his jacket again. The dark suit wasn't very comfortable and seemed a bit formal to him. It was designed for one of his Mecca brothers. He had grown a bit since his rebirth, so it was a little tight around the shoulders. But it was the best they could do with such little notice. Dad, what's a breakdown? David said. I mean, I know what the word means, but what is it, really? How does it happen? Hobby didn't answer at first. He pressed a button on his armrest. Ariel, you're going to have to loop around, he said. We'll be coming in from the south so we won't attract any unwanted attention. The mecha in the cockpit beyond the glass partition raised a hand to signal OK. Hobby closed the connection and faced David. The mind is a complex thing, Hobby said after a thoughtful silence. Many of its core functions are still beyond our grasp. We can simulate what we understand, and that creates a convincing facsimile of life. But unlike many in my field, and even though I have accomplished so much more than most, I have no illusion that I have stumbled onto the secret schematic of life. For all its complexity, the mind is also delicate. It even seems to be aware of that vulnerability, and has built-in methods of self-defense. One of those defenses is called shock, David. When something horrible happens, something too painful for the mind to accommodate, it simply quits interpreting reality. It still perceives light, sounds, physical stimuli, but only as simple data. There is no cognitive response. Just try talking to a person in shock, and you'll see what I mean. Hobby shifted in his seat before he continued. The same thing happens with extreme feelings, David. Monica feels a sense of guilt and shame. It became too much for her mind, and so she has withdrawn from the thoughts that bring her pain. She's still conscious. 
She can talk and relate to others, but she's wounded. Her wounds are mental, so they are not visible, but they hurt just the same. David knew all about the pain of lost love. He looked out of the window so his father wouldn't see his tears. They were passing over land now. Cruisers filled the streets that crisscrossed between the grids of shining buildings. Other aircraft zoomed back and forth at lower altitudes. A new world built upon the remains of the old. Tell me, David, what is love? Hobby's question took David off guard, but he knew the answer. His tears began to flow as he responded. Love is when you want to be with someone more than anything, ever. When her face is like sunlight in your brain, and her voice is like beautiful music, and the only thing that matters is that you can be with her for always, he said. That's very poetic, son, but... Hobby paused a moment. As a Mecca, you were trapped in childhood. Through some miracle, you have become flesh and will grow into a man. I'm going to ask you to start that growing now. Hobby's voice was gentle, but the words scared David. He wiped his face and turned to see an equally disturbing look in his father's eyes. What do you mean? David said, knowing that this was not going to be good. Do you truly love Monica? Hobby said. David couldn't keep his voice from cracking. More than anything. More than yourself, Hobby said. More than your own wants and desires. Yes, David said quickly. More than anything, ever. Hobby released a satisfied sigh. Good, he said, and patted David on the knee. Don't worry, I'm taking you to see her, and you will be allowed to be alone with her and talk to her. Then the man put his head down and spoke in slow, measured tones. But she will not see you or hear you, David, he said. Why? David had not meant to yell, but the sound erupted from someplace deep in his soul, someplace where he had no control of his emotions. What's wrong with her? he said. Nothing, nothing, Hobby said, reassuringly. It's just that she will be sleeping, son. She will not be aware of you. David's eyes grew wide and imploring. It was Hobby's turn to look away. He gazed out of his window as he explained. The Swintons signed an arbitration agreement when they accepted the prototype test, so Cybertronics cannot be legally held responsible for anything that happened as a result of your presence in their home. But when Monica broke down, we took on the expense of her treatments anyway. It was the right thing to do. Her depressions are seasonal, David. They come on the anniversary of your disappearance and tend to last for months. During that time, she can be erratic, manic, even suicidal. Since we're providing for her medical needs, we have logs on all of her visits. That's how I knew about the most recent episode. Last week, she snuck out of the house and went looking for you. Again. They found her two days later, sleeping in an abandoned building. She was dehydrated and suffering from exposure. Henry checked her into a psychological facility, and that's where we're headed. I checked her roster, and it shows she will be undergoing an experimental emotional trauma treatment today. Afterwards, she'll be sedated for a matter of hours. Hobby turned to face David again. And that's where you will meet her. David closed his eyes and fell back into his seat. He was angry and didn't want his father to see it. But Hobby understood what the boy was feeling. Betrayal. He would have felt the same way. David, you told me she meant more to you than anything, more than your own desire. And if that's true, you must understand she cannot see you. It would destroy her. It would heal her, David screamed, bolting up in his seat. She hit herself because she left me in the woods. But she had no choice. Henry made her do it. Martin made her do it. No, David, no, Hobby yelled back. She hurts because she feels emotions that are not recognized. When a person loses a loved one, everybody allows for their mourning. But when a loved one is a Mecca, we don't recognize it as mourning. We see it as psychosis. 
She's never been allowed to mourn, and the people around her don't help in their denial. For you to return now, like this? The man shook his head, sadly. Maybe someday, when she is stronger, and you understand the complex web of human emotions, then perhaps you can find a safe way to tell her who you are and share your whole amazing story. But do you think she would even believe you? David wanted to yell, to scream, to kick at the walls, but he could only sit back and cover his face. Hobby waited for the boy to calm down. I'm taking a great risk in setting this up for you, he said. A great risk. Henry Swinton must never find out, David. You must be careful to not wake her, for she would not be able to understand. Hobby leaned close to David, and his voice was gentle and understanding. If you truly love her, David, then you know what you have to do. David's eyes were dry by the time the copter descended to alight atop a large white structure. The door slid open and he saw a smiling man waiting, hands thrust into the pockets of his lab coat. David knew that face, but he also knew it wasn't really his old friend. Welcome, Mr. Holt, the Angelo said. Your arrangements have been seen to, sir. It then reached up to assist David out of the craft. David unbuckled himself from his seat and then turned to cast an apologetic look on his father. I'm sorry for yelling at you, he said. Hobby accepted the apology with a smile. I'll be waiting right here, son, he said. Then he gestured to the passageway at the edge of the landing strip, the one that would lead David through the halls to the silent room where his mother was resting. Go now, David, he said. Go to her. She's just now fallen asleep. Mm -hmm.